Thank you, Craig. Thanks, everybody, for being here, and thanks for coming back. Appreciate that very much. We, uh, we are uh, people that likes to hope. You know, even when we're young, when I was young anyway, uh, I'd always hope as a kid for Christmas. I just couldn't wait for Christmas to come around. And you know, when we get a little older, you get to be an adolescent, you hope uh, you can find a young man or young lady to date, uh, get to know, maybe marry someday. When you get a little older, you hope for a good job. And not long after that, you hope for a promotion. And then we get to hoping for a, for a nice house that we'll be able to, to buy. You hope for children. Then we hope for grandchildren. We hope to retire. We hope for good health. And then we have other hopes outside just our family. We hope for our nation. That's a hope that I have right now that, that uh, you know, things will turn around for our nation. And then uh, you have little miscellaneous quandary hopes, like I was noticing this morning. I hope I'm not the guy that has to turn out or to change these uh, bad light bulbs up here in this ceiling. But we throw around the term hope, you know, as, as if it's a wish. And really, uh, there's a distinct difference between the two words. If we wish for something, that means that we yearn for something, we long for something. And sometimes when we use the word hope, we use it in the very same way. We yearn for something, we long for something. But there's a difference really in the, in the, the words wish and hope. We wish for a lot of things, but we say we hope for a lot of things, but really we mean we wish for it. Whenever we hope for something, we yearn for it, we long for it, but we earnestly expect it. And that's the difference between wishing for something and hoping for something. And when we talk about hope in the biblical sense, we have to have an understanding of what the word hope means. And the best definition that I've run across as far as hope is concerned is earnest expectation of that which has been promised. And that's what we want to talk about today. In Hebrews chapter 7 verse 18, the Bible says, For on the one hand there is the annulling of the former commandment because of its weakness and unprofitableness, for the law made nothing perfect or complete. And I think the guys this morning have covered that very well. On the other hand, and what we're going to talk about here this afternoon, there is the bringing in of a better hope. There is the bringing in of a better hope through which we draw near to God. <clears throat> and I think uh, the best way to kind of illustrate what biblical hope is, is in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 10. Here Paul says, For our sakes, no doubt, this is written, that he who plows should plow in hope, and he who thresh threshes in hope should be partaker of his hope. Now I just suppose that there's probably several guys in the crowd today that a few weeks ago you probably uh, got on the tractors and you went out, you plowed up some ground, and you sowed some seed. I know some of you uh, sowed some cotton. Some of you may have sown corn. I don't know other crops, various crops. I went to my little garden spot and I sowed some corn and I sowed some okra. And when I sowed this crop, I didn't go to the trouble and expense of sowing this seed, planting it, buying the seed, all this stuff, because I expected failure. I expected in a few weeks there'd be corn plants coming up, okra plants coming up. And I'm sure you were the same way when you planted your cotton crops. Now he says that we plow in hope, we sow in hope, we thresh in hope, and you went to the trouble to buy all that seed, to put that seed in the ground, because you expected a crop. Well, why did you expect a crop? If you look in Genesis chapter 8, verse 21, the Bible says, Then the Lord said in his heart, I will never again curse the ground for man's sake. Although the imagination of a man's heart is evil from his youth, nor will I again destroy every living thing as I have done. Now notice what, what he says here. And notice the Lord said here, While the earth remains, 
Seed time and harvest, cold and heat, winter and summer, and day and night shall not cease. This is a promise of God. And what I think we need to talk about whenever we talk about hope is God's promises and our hope in those promises. We look at this, the Lord said, seed time and harvest shall not cease, cold and heat shall not cease, winter and summer shall not cease. These are promises of God. Now when we talk about promises of God and relate this to hope and the subject uh, in general, the, the better way that we're talking about today, we need to go to uh, uh, Hebrews and we'll do that in just a minute. But the, the central character has already been stated this, uh, earlier today that we need to talk about Abraham because Abraham is so central in demonstrating to us the importance of God's promises and how God carries out those promises and his hope, his biblical expectating hope, if you want to think about it that way, it's important for us to see that in Abraham's life. Remember in Genesis chapter 12 and verse 1, now the Lord said to Abraham, get out of your country from your family, from your father's house to a land that I will show you. I'll make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and I will curse him who curses you. And in you, all families of the earth shall be blessed. Now here he made three promises to Abraham. He told him that he would make him a great nation. He would make his name great. And the third promise is the one we want to concentrate on today. Through his seed or through his descendants, all families of the earth would be blessed. Now, that's all fine and good until you start to take account what was mentioned in the previous chapter, chapter 11, verse 30, but Sarah was barren and she had no child. Now, if you look at God's promise there, the third one, in you all families of the earth shall be blessed. And then you couple that with what chapter 11 verse 30 says, there's a little bit of an issue here. Because if God promised Abraham that through his descendants all nations of the earth were going to be blessed, that involves children. And Abraham and Sarah weren't going to have any children because the Bible says that Sarah was born, was barren. She was not able to physically conceive a child for whatever reason, but that's just how she was born. That's how she was. There was no change in that. Now, if we read on in chapter 18 of Genesis, the Bible tells us now Sarah or Abraham and Sarah were old and well advanced in age, and Sarah had passed the age of childbearing. The New King James says it ceased to be with Sarah after the manner of women. Even if she was physically able to conceive a child, she had reached the age to where she was too old. Now we'll read in just a minute where Sarah and Abraham at this time, Sarah was about 90 years old, Abraham was about 100 years old, but yet God had made this promise to him that through his seed, through his descendants, all nations of the earth would be blessed. And that, of course, is talking about Jesus. Well, how was God going to bring this about? You know, there was a kind of a question in Abraham's mind at this point in time. In Genesis chapter 15, I don't have this on the screen, but <clears throat> in Genesis chapter 15, we can read where Abraham was a little troubled about this because he didn't have any children and it looked, looked like he wasn't going to have any children. And so the, the Lord appeared to him in a vision in Genesis chapter 15. And in this vision, the Lord told him, don't worry, Abraham. My promise is true. But Abraham said, well, Lord, I'm not able to have children what about this descendant I've got over here in Damascus? I believe his name was uh, Eliezer. Uh, may have been close to Eleazar, but anyway, he had a descendant over in Damascus. And Abraham said, well, since he's part of my house, why not just count him as part of my descendants and let this promise come through this nephew 
You know, it could have been a nephew or cousin or it, it didn't really matter because the Lord said, no, Abraham, your descendant, your seed will come from your body, not someone else's. And so the Lord made it very plain there in Genesis chapter 15, Abraham, your descendants will be from your body. And further, he told him there in Genesis chapter 15, he said, I want you to look up at the sky. So Abraham looked up at the sky and he saw all the stars. And the Lord said, so shall your descendants be. God made a promise to him that from his seed, from his body, his descendants would be numbered like the stars in heaven. Now that was in Genesis chapter 15. Now as the, as the story goes on, the child was born, Isaac, the child of promise. But in Romans chapter 4, Paul sheds a little light as to Abraham's attitude when all this happened. God had made the promise. Abraham at first, he couldn't figure it out. You know, how's this going to happen if I can't have any kids? How are you going to bring about this promise that through my seed, all nations of the earth are going to be blessed? Paul said in Romans 4, who, talking about Abraham, who contrary to hope, in hope believed. The way we would put that is, Abraham had hope, against hope. All his hope was gone. It's kind of like that helpless situation that Larry talked about earlier. Just not having any way to get out of it. He was married to Sarah. Sarah couldn't have children. What was he going to do? How was he going to have children? He might not have been able to see the light at the end of the tunnel at that particular point, but God kept promising him and telling him, Abraham, don't be afraid. It's going to come about. Paul says, who contrary to hope in hope believes so that he became the father of many nations according to what was spoken, so shall your descendants be. You remember when he told him to look at the stars? And not being weak in faith, he did not consider his own body already dead, not physically dead, but you might say physiologically dead. He was too old to have children. He did not consider his own body already dead since he was about a hundred years old and the deadness of Sarah's womb. He did not waver at the promise. He didn't waver. You know, that, to me, that just says so much. How do, we, how do we react to God's promises? You know, a lot of times we waver. We get weak. We know God's promises. He promises eternal life. Sometimes people waver at that promise. All kinds of things God promises us. And what do we do? We're weak, we're human, we waver. But Abraham did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God and being fully convinced. There was no doubt in his mind that what he had promised, God had promised, he was able also to perform. And therefore, it was accounted to him for righteousness. Verse 23 says, Now it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him. These things, you know, we can read about these things in Genesis. We can read about what Paul talks about in Romans concerning Abraham in the book of Genesis. But these things were not just written for Abraham's sake. These things were written for our sakes, for our learning, the scriptures say. <clears throat> it was also written for us. It shall be imputed to us who believe in him, who raised up Jesus, our Lord, from the dead, who was delivered up because of our offenses and was raised for our justification. Now, in Genesis chapter 22, the first part of this chapter, we all remember the story how that, that God told Abraham, okay, you've got this descendant, you've got this son Isaac, I want you to take this son Isaac and I want you to offer him as a burnt sacrifice. Now Abraham didn't waver at this, at this either. The Bible says he got up early the next morning, 
got everything packed up, got the, got the people ready to go, got Isaac ready to go, and went on a three-day trip to around the area of Moriah, three-day trip for a burnt offering involving his son, his only son whom he loved. Now, you remember the story how that Abraham got everything ready, got the altar ready, had the knife raised and was about to slay his own son. The angel of the Lord stayed his hand and you know what God said? Now I know. I've seen your faith and now I know. And his son was spared. <clears throat> if we read in uh, Genesis 22 and verse 15, the angel of the Lord called Abraham a second time. Now this is just after Isaac was about to be sacrificed here comes the angel again, the Bible says a second time, and the angel is going to speak to him about some promises. Here the Lord says, by myself I have sworn, says the Lord, because you have done this thing, willing to sacrifice your son, because you uh, have done this thing and have not withheld your son, your only son, blessing I will bless you and multiplying I will multiply your descendants as the stars of heaven and as the sand which is on the seashore. And your descendants shall possess the gate of their enemies, and your seed, all nations of the earth, shall be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. Now, does this sound familiar? This sounds just like Genesis chapter 12, 10 chapters earlier, where God made Abraham three promises. He said, I'll make your name great, I'll make you a great nation, and through your seed, all families of the earth shall be blessed. These are the same three promises. Well, what's the difference here? There is a slight difference, but it's very significant. Remember what he said in verse 16? The Lord said, by myself, and he didn't mean he was all alone. He meant, by me, I have sworn, says the Lord. The difference in chapter 12 and verse, and uh, the, the promises given there in chapter 22, the promises given to Abraham, they were the same three promises, but this time in Genesis chapter 22, the Lord adds this idea of putting an oath on his promise. Now you would think that if God made a promise, that ought to be enough. That ought to be strong enough. But what did the Lord do here in, in chapter 22? He kind of wrapped up that promise extra, extra tight. He put an oath on this promise. Why did he do that? Because he wanted Abraham, in our everyday language, he wanted Abraham to really, really understand that he meant this promise. This was no fluke. God meant exactly what he said. And so he put an oath on this promise. He says, because you have done this thing and have not withheld your son, your only son. Now, if we look in Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 13, the Bible says, when God made a promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no one greater, he swore by himself, saying, surely blessing I will bless you and multiplying I'll multiply you. And so after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. For men indeed swear by the greater, and an oath of confirmation is for them an end of all dispute. Thus God determining to show more abundantly to the heirs of promise. That's us. That's me and you. you remember Larry read this morning in Galatians chapter 3. For as many of you as been, has, have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Verse 29 says, and if we be Christ... Then we are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So being baptized into Christ makes us, you got Abraham here, you had David later on, you had Jesus. And if we're baptized into Christ, we are of the lineage of Abraham. And so he says here that God put an oath on this promise, determining to show more abundantly to us the heirs of promise, the immutability of his counsel. He put an oath on that promise to show us that when he promises something, he really means it. 
Let there be no doubt. And he confirmed it by an oath. Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 18. That by two immutable things, an oath and a promise, that by two immutable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we might have strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold of the hope set before us. God gives a promise. He confirmed it with an oath. And you could say this is an ironclad promise. God is going to bring it to pass. And notice what he says in verse 19. This hope, God's promise, that all nations through his seed would be blessed, which comes right down to you and me. This hope we have as an anchor for the soul, both sure and steadfast. <clears throat> now, when the Bible says this hope we have, we need to use this word hope in the biblical sense like we talked about earlier. And what was that? Earnest expectation. When God promised to Abraham, through your seed all nations would be blessed, which comes right down to us, we can expect it. That's how sure and ironclad it is. We don't have to doubt it. We can expect it and we should expect it. It's an acre for the soul, the Bible says. So, so far we've seen that the Bible definition for hope is earnest expectation of that which has been promised. And we read in the story of Abraham that God makes promises and he follows through with those promises so that people like Abraham and all down through time who have been of the lineage of Abraham can not only believe that promise, but bank on it, count on it, expect it as the word hope means. And remember in 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 9 that the Lord is not slack concerning his promise. So, I ask you now, Jeremiah 31, 34, the Lord says, I'll forgive their iniquity and their sin I will remember no more. In Hebrews 10, verse 4, the Bible says, it's not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sins. So think about it. I'll remember no more sins. Blood of bulls and goats can't take away sins. Which one sounds better? You know, Michael nailed it a while ago. He said, we've got a good deal. He says, there are sins and there are iniquities. I will remember no more. Hebrews 10 verse 12. But this man after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, as opposed to Hebrews 10 and verse 3, but in those sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins every year. One sacrifice or a sacrifice year by year. Which one's better? That's a no-brainer. Now here, to me, I call this the crown jewel. 1 John chapter 2 and verse 25. And this is the promise that he has promised us. Eternal life. Now, based on the promises that God gave to Abraham and how God wanted to make sure, absolutely sure, that Abraham believed those promises, and God promised that he would stand behind those promises with an oath in view of these promises. And when he promises us eternal life, why should we have any doubt whatsoever about the promise of eternal life? Our better hope, our earnest expectation is in the Lord's promise of eternal life. 1 John 1, uh, chapter 5 and verse 11, and this is the testimony that God has given us eternal life, and this life is in His Son. Now I'm going to read some passages here concerning this promise of eternal life. I want you to notice that every one of them have a connection with Jesus. And as has been stated earlier today, this promise of eternal life can only come through Jesus Christ, through His shed blood and us being washed in that blood. 
1 John 5 and verse 13, the Bible says, These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that you have eternal life, and that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. Now, what happens when we fail to continue to believe in the name of the Son of God? That's when we have issues. That's when there's a problem. Titus chapter 1, verse 1. Paul, a bondservant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect and the acknowledgement of the truth which accords with godliness in hope, or as we've been saying, in expectation of eternal life which God, who cannot lie, promised before time began. It is our expectation. And notice... How that this ties in with the blood of Jesus Christ. In Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 18, this hope we have as an anchor for the soul, both sure and steadfast. It's through Jesus Christ. Titus 3 verse 4, but when the kindness and love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness which, which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. That washing and regeneration has to do with baptism and us being washed, uh, our sins washed away. Whom he poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior. We weren't our own Savior. Our own works didn't save us, nor could they. Could they ever save us? But our faith in Jesus Christ and his death and the burial and his resurrection, that having been justified by his grace, Grace, we should become heirs according to the hope or the earnest expectation of eternal life. When I mention eternal life, do we expect it? We should. There's no reason why as Christians we shouldn't. God has promised. We see that God backs up His promise. His promises are not weak. They're as strong as they can be. And the hope that we have in those promises should be ironclad just as well. 1 Peter 1 and verse 1, or verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again unto a living hope, or we should say a living expectation through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that does not fade away reserved in heaven for you who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation ready to be revealed at the last time. First Peter 1 <clears throat> verse 20, he indeed was foreordained for the foundation of, before the foundation of the world but was manifest in these last times for you who through him believe in God who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. Your faith Faith and your expectation of eternal life should be in God. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 11. This is a faithful saying. For if we died with him, we shall also live with him. If we endure, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he will also deny us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful. He cannot deny himself. Now here's some more of those if and then statements. If we died with him. We'll live with him. That's the only way we'll live with him, is if we died with him. If we endure, we'll also reign with him. What if we don't endure? Is that possible? I think it is. I don't think he'd have mentioned or put this if in there if it were not possible. What if we don't endure? Then again, that's where we have issues. That's where we better examine ourselves. And that's where our faith better get to. I want to pause for just a second, or kind of shift gears here for just a second, and talk about one more time passage in Hebrews chapter 6. Now we've battered this, this passage to death this afternoon, but one more thing I want to notice about it. The Bible says here that by two immutable things, remember, a promise and an oath clad together, coupled together, that by two immutable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we might have not just consolation, but strong consolation. 
who have fled for refuge to lay hold of the hope or the expectation that's been set before us. That phrase right there, fled for refuge. When I think about this, I think about over in Numbers chapter 25. Y'all remember the story about the cities of refuge? Remember those cities of refuge were set up so that someone who accidentally killed a man, was guilty of manslaughter, might flee to one of these cities. And as long as he stayed in that city, he was safe until the death of the high priest at that time. Now, the cities, one of them was, uh, let's see, I believe that's a Golan that was up here to the north. It's hard to see on this map, or there's Golan right there. The city of Ramoth, uh, Bezer, the city of Hebron, Shechem, and Kadesh, right up in that area. And here's the river Jordan that kind of separates this land of Israel. And it didn't matter where a Hebrew was in the land of Israel, he could get to one of those cities of refuge pretty easy within maybe a day or two's journey. Now, once he got into that city of refuge, that guy was safe. There was no getting him. He was safe in that city of refuge. I think about that and then I think about this verse. Romans 8 verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. If you're not baptized into Christ, you don't have this hope. It's empty. There's no condemnation now to those who are in Christ Jesus who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Well, what if you do walk according to the flesh? You'd be just like old Abner. You remember old Abner and Joab, the story? Joab was after Abner. Abner had gone to one of those cities of refuge. And while he was in the city, he was just fine. He was safe. There was no worry. But remember what happened? He evidently stepped out of the city. And there was Joab. And Joab took his life just like that. What about us? as Christians. You know, I believe what the Bible says here. There's no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. That's you and me, if we've been baptized into Christ. But notice he said, who do not walk according to the flesh. Now, if you're walking according to the flesh, that is a broad statement that covers a lot of different types of sin. If we're walking in sin, we don't have this assurance. No condemnation is to those who are walking in Christ, who are in Christ and not walking according to the flesh. So what does that tell us? That tells me that as long as we are walking in the spirit, and I'm not gonna draw definite boundaries here on this, But as long as we are doing the best that we can, if sin crops up, we need to get rid of that sin. If we're on top of our sin in that respect, we don't have to fear. You remember Paul? I don't have this on the screen, but you know the Apostle Paul, and this was mentioned a little bit earlier, you would think that a guy that's an apostle You know, boy, he's got it made. He's an apostle. You don't have to worry about that guy sinning. But you know, Paul didn't see it that way. Romans chapter 7, he talks about the battle within. He said, you know, I know what I need to be doing. And when it comes right down to it, I do the very opposite thing. There's things that I need to be avoiding And I find that those are the very things that I do. Paul dealt with sin all the time, and he talks about it. Every day there was a war going on within him. Does that happen to you? Well, it happens to me. And not only just once a day, but multiple times a day. 
The temptations arise. We know what we ought to do. But what do we do? We do the exact opposite. Things we should avoid. What do we do? That, those are the very things that we do. Just like Paul. Just because Paul was an apostle didn't mean that he was exempt from temptation and giving in to sin. And he says in, cha- in verse 24 of that chapter, Romans chapter 7, he said, oh, wretched man that I am. That was his conscience. And when our conscience bothers us, you know why it, why it is? It's because of that war going on inside of us. But this is the same guy who later on said, the time of my departure is at hand. I've finished my course. I've run the race. Henceforth, there's laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me in that day. Paul was confident. He was a sinner. He got weak. But still, he was confident in God's promise. His hope was not banished. In Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, And we desire that each of you show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope. Now, in closing, I want to talk about our faith as a weapon of evangelism. Have you ever thought about that? You know, Brother Nall this morning, and I appreciate so much your prayer, Brother Nall, about putting on the armor that we need to put on. Part of that armor is the breastplate of faith and love. And also, as a helmet, the hope of salvation. Now I think we know what a breastplate of faith and love should be. It should be something that people see in the way that we conduct ourselves. And the same thing is true with the helmet of hope. People should be able to look at us and see that there's hope in us. And you know what happens? If they see that hope in us, 1 Peter 3 and verse 15 says, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you. Now listen, folks, if people can't see hope in us, if people can't see hope radiate from us in the way that we conduct ourselves, how in the world can we expect them to ask a question about our hope? Our hope needs to be something that we live It needs to be something that people that we work with, we go to school with, can see in us. And when they see in us, hey, there's something different about that person. They want to know about it. I look at that as a tool of evangelism. And if you think that doesn't happen, just ask my wife. Ask me. It happened to me just this last week. It happens to people all the time. People see that there's something different about us. And they want to know more. One of our members there at home, this happened to her. The girl asked her, well, there's something different about you. And so the member of the church expounded unto her, invited her to church. She was baptized about two weeks ago. And I tell you what, she is biting at the bit. She is converted now. And it was because hope, the better hope, shown to her. She wore it as a helmet. And finally, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 23. Here the Bible says, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. You ever think about your hope as a confession? You know, Jesus told us that if we confess men before God, he'll confess confess us before the Father. And a lot of times we take that to mean, well, Right before we're about to be baptized, we confess that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. But confessing Christ is so much more than making that one confession. Confession of Christ should be a daily part of what happens with us. And I like to think about it this way. Let us hold fast, not the confession, but the profession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. Brethren. We not only have the better hope, but we have the best hope. God bless you. Thank you for listening.